that some have said that it gives four different groups here. That in these uh, fruit here, there's nine fruit that are mentioned. We also mentioned that, you know, this is the fruit of the Spirit. It's that which God infills us when we accept him as our Savior. He fills us with his Spirit. And so he doesn't necessarily give love to you and, and temperance to somebody else and so on. We have it all inclusive. That's a part of the Spirit. And so it helps us to understand that we can look at these different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit and check ourselves. Do I have what the Lord is requiring or what he expects? And if it doesn't, and if we're not there, have we maybe not completely yielded ourselves to all aspects of the fruit of the Spirit or the Spirit within us? And we can grow thereby and I've checked my own lives, and it's a good way to check our lives, to see where we are in relation to uh, our relationship with God. <clears throat> now, love has been covered at Michigan City, and, and uh, now it slipped my mind. Joy and peace, that's what I want. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. Uh, those first three have been covered already, and they want me to be talking about temperance. Uh, that's the, the second part, is, or the second group, is love and, uh, or uh, joy and peace. They, they fit together, in a sense. Love actually infills all of them, but then... Joy and peace kind of fit together. They go hand in hand. And then, of course, the next number go fit together in the third part, and that's long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness. Graces that relate to others. And that's what I'd like to look at one aspect of that, and that's temperance, this, or long-suffering this morning. Uh, but gentleness and goodness faith or fidelity and meekness all have to do with our relationship with others, how we deal with them. And I'd like to, first of all, then, as we think of long-suffering, think of the long-suffering of God. Uh, where would you and I be if God would not have been long-suffering toward us? What is long-suffering? We want to enter into that this morning. Um, we're not talking about a long-suffering that deals only with that of when we're facing persecution. But it does include that. Long-suffering is much more than that. The Greek definition gives a word there of forbearance or fortitude. Fortitude means to bear misfortune and pain or those things that come against us with calmness and, with, and patiently. That's what forbearance means according to the Greek. <clears throat> Romans 2.4 gives us an indication a little bit of how God looks at forbearance. And he gave that, uh, Paul gave that definition there in verse 4 of chapter 2. It says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. And that's dealing, that's in relation to our salvation. Uh, do we. Accept it, or do we reject it, that which he did? Jesus had, or God, through Jesus, gave us and showed us his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering. He kept on, and he continued. Forbearance has that which also is 
an even temper, a controlled temper, or slow to anger. It's involved in forbearance and long-suffering. Bearing difficulties from others patiently. All those things contribute to the thought of long-suffering. And as we think of that, I think of God and his goodness. That for the devotional we had this morning and some of the songs that we sang showed us the long-suffering of God, waiting patiently until we accept. He's still working on me. He's still working in our lives, um, making us more fruitful and better, preparing for eternity. But as we live here, we have that peace and joy in our lives because of the love of God within us and the Spirit working within us. Do we have long-suffering and patience with each other, forbearance, fortitude? We also know that a lot of scriptures, as it relates to long-suffering, mentions forbearance along with it. Now, fortitude is more of a newer English word that probably wasn't in existence. Maybe it was back in those days when they wrote the scriptures, but it gives the same kind of thoughts. But I was uh, impressed with the different scriptures I was looking up where for, uh, forbearance was mentioned along with long-suffering. <clears throat> There's another thought that comes through. Adam Clark gave that thought. He called it long-mindedness. That was an interesting term that uh, I had to meditate on a little bit, and I was thankful that I did because it uh, tells us another aspect of God's long-suffering long-mindedness. Um, God sees the whole picture. Many times we don't see, we, we see too narrow. We can't see the future. God can. And he often has long-mindedness involved. <clears throat> long-mindedness is that which we aren't reactionary. We talked about that thought in our Sunday school class of, you know, we're to listen. We have, someone made the mention, we have two ears and one mouth, so we ought to leave, listen twice as much as we talk. Um, but we have a tendency to hear a little bit, and we become reactionary, and we voice something so quickly. And then many times later have to repent and go back and confess and make things right because we were reactionary. God is one who is long-minded. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees the whole picture, we sometimes say. And so we don't understand everything, maybe. But God does. And we ought to take that in consideration. Uh, to forbear... According to the dictionary, I was impressed with that thought. Uh, according to Webster's Dictionary, and it's an older one, it gives the thought of an ancestor. And I dwelled on that. What does ancestor have to do with forbearance or to forbear? But it indicates there's a period of time involved. Um, we keep ourselves in check and we tolerate and we don't speak real quickly. We try to analyze the whole situation. We're careful. That's something that goes along with long suffering. As we think of that, it also helps us uh, to be patient with a purpose or goal. Isaiah 48, nine, I'd like to read that verse. It talks about that a little bit, how God is that way. Isaiah 48, verse 9 says, For my name's sake will I deter my anger, defer my anger, and for my praise will I refrain for, them, for thee that I cut thee not off. Talking about Israelites back in those times in Isaiah there. But God refrains himself from doing what he 
because he's long-minded. He's long-suffering, and he continues to patiently wait for us because he has a purpose or a goal in mind. He keeps himself in check and doesn't destroy immediately, but gives us another opportunity. Aren't you glad that God is that kind of a God? Where would I be if I if God would not have been long-suffering with me. We want to also notice that long-suffering has two different aspects. One, being long-minded and patient with difficulties and misunderstandings that others put in our way. We're thinking of others doing something to us that hurt us, possibly, spiritually hurt us, maybe even. Or there's misunderstandings involved, and, and we become critical of each other too many times, and we aren't forbearing one to another. Giving the second, the benefit of the doubt to others is another way we sometimes say it. But we take a conclusion, and we think of the worst of each other rather than forbearing and un trying to understand why would have he done these things. A good example, and I take this, this is not s spiritual things, but when something happens, someone does something in our society today, even in an accident, it seems obvious sometimes that this is the way it is, but what does the law do? They investigate. Regardless of how it appears to be this way, but they investigate before they make a decision. Can we as Christians do the same one toward another in our relationships? Can we be long-suffering and give the benefit of the doubt and try to understand why someone did what he did or said what he did? Maybe some of his upbringing will cause a person to do what he did or say what he did. Can we understand and help and maybe direct and guide to a better way? <clears throat> First Corinthians 13, verse say, 4 says, Charity suffereth long. Charity is love. That's the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, thinketh no evil. <clears throat> As I was thinking of that, I had to think of Jesus on the cross. What were some of his last sayings he made when he was on the cross? Here there were those who had put him on the cross, nailed him, all the torture that was involved there. But Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't understand what they have done. Actually, they did what was supposed to happen because Jesus was to be crucified. That's prophesied for that. And he was to give his life. But the heart of God, the heart of Jesus, forgave them because they didn't understand what they were doing. But as we think of that, as we think long-mindedness, it helps us to forgive people, those that do things toward us. Not to hold them guilty is what it means when we forgive. Have patience with a purpose because we want a greater thing come out of this. We're not condemning because we would like to draw them and bring them in to the kingdom. We will take the suffering ourselves rather than to condemn them. Long-mindedness. Long-suffering. We do this in consideration of what God has done for us. Jesus died on the cross and forgave. Matthew 10, verse 8 says, and that verse there, or this verse here, is in dealing with when Jesus sent 
the 12 out to two by two to go spread the word. And he said, preach, the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal, cleanse, raise the dead. And he said, freely you have received, freely give. It's what you have been given that will cause you to go forth and to share truth and to go the second mile to help others, to bring them in, those that stand against you. That's not always easy. I found it hard. But you know, when we have God's grace, the spirit within, and he tells us uh, many times we say, I don't know what to say or uh, what will I say? Will he bring the verses to mind? Well, we need to prepare to a certain extent. We need to memorize. We need to learn and study the scriptures. But then when that moment comes, God can take those scripture verses, those words, those experiences in your life, and he can translate them over in a way that you can share it with them and be able to bless others and to help others come to know God. It's that of forgiving and receiving those that have stood against you. The second aspect to long-suffering is to be patient and endure those things that God sets before us in life without murmuring and complaining. <clears throat> if we read through the different scriptures of Paul, many epistles that he wrote that we have, God placed many difficult situations before Paul. But what did he do? How did he respond to those situations? <clears throat> he used them as stepping stones. When he was stoned and they thought he was dead, he revived again and went on preaching. He didn't quit. He didn't run. That's what our tendency is, or mine, many times. If that's the way you're going to do it, I'll do something else. But no, we continue on when those things come against us. We don't murmur or complain. We continue the work. To cheerfully submit to them, knowing that I can benefit from every occurrence that comes before me. God can take those things and turn them around, and it can be a blessing and be a healing, a strength to us. James 5, verse 11, I'd like to turn to. James 5, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He brings in the thought of Job, and we all know what Job went through. I don't know if I could have stood up to what, like Job did. He lost everything, and, and if you read that, it just happened. One act, Satan is relentless. He don't care about you. He does. He goes to the greatest extent he can to keep you from experiencing the love of God and the experiences that come from the love of God in our lives, the peace and the joy, even though there's hardships and difficulties sometimes. But we notice that Job was able to bless the Lord. The Lord gave and he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord when he lost everything. Children, house, and everything. And then, worst of all yet, his wife turned against him, and he continued to be faithful. Job is a primary example of counting it happy to endure in our difficult cir circumstances that come our way that Satan brings to us at times. God does those things. What about 
Abraham, when he was asked, well, he was way old when he received Isaac. And it was past age. And he grew up to be a boy, a young man. Then God says, go sacrifice him. Give him back to me. What would have went through your heart? But you know, the faith Abraham had, he believed that God was going to do something. And he was obedient. And God did something. That's the kind of faith we need to continue on. And to be long-suffering, to do and be faithful, carried it up. Wonder how his heart felt when the son said, Father, here's the wood and the fire to build an altar or to make an offering to God. But we need a sacrifice. Where's it? What would you have answered? We see the faith that Abraham had. God himself will provide an offering. I don't know if Abraham knew what that was. I don't think he did. He was going to kill his son on the altar. And the second thing is the son was in submission and did what the father was going to do. Laid on the altar. I don't know if he was tied or not. I didn't read that account. But he was laid on the altar, and Abraham was ready to kill him when God called and blessed it with a lamb in the thicket. God provided. Long-suffering. Going on and seeing the end of the result of long-suffering and waiting patiently upon God. Can we do that in our life's experiences that he puts before us? I remember when we were called to go to Romania. And I still very vividly remember on that train, seven hours going from Bucharest to Sichaba. And I told my wife, I said, what are we doing here? We've never been here before. We don't even know what's ahead of us, but we're going. And we kept going. And he blessed us in many ways. We don't have to know the end, but we need to follow on and suffer and forbear and wait on God and allow him to be a blessing for us. <clears throat> James Turning back one more page in James, another precious verse. Reading verses 2 to 4 in relation to forbearance and long-suffering. says there, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. That's God placing things before us. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Complete trust in Jesus. Complete trust in God that he's going to work it all out, just as he did for Abraham. Long-suffering and forbearance are a part of God's nature. And as Christians, it needs to be a part of our nature, too. <clears throat> in Exodus 34, I'd like to turn to that. Read a few verses there in Exodus 34 concerning Moses. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And this is concerning Moses' experience what happened. This is after Moses had gone up in the mountain and God had hewed out some tables of stone and written on them. We called them the Ten Commandments and had given them to Moses. And, and he went down from the mount. And when he was on his way down, he heard music and dancing. And here, his followers, the children of Israel, had made a golden calf and were worshiping it. And he cast 
the tables of stone to the ground and they broke. And he went down, he pled with, the, with God concerning the children of Israel, had mercy upon them. Even there, he said, God said, stand aside and I'll destroy him. And Moses said, no, don't do that. Take my name out of the book of life instead. We can see the compassion Moses had for the people. The long-sufferingness of Moses. And now, he was again called to go up in the mountain. But as he went up to the mountain to, again, uh, God wanted to make a new set of Ten Commandments for him. But, you know, because they were broken, Moses had a little payday to do. He had to hew the tables out himself. Then God wrote on him. There was a requirement there. And Moses hewed out some tables and took them up on the mount. And as he's up there, God wrote upon them. <clears throat> and then we go here in verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for those for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will lay by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. We notice two things here. Moses had a type of iniquity there in casting down the Ten Commandments, or you might say destroying the word. God wasn't very pleased with that. He was pleased that he had compassion on the people, but he was not pleased that he destroyed the word, and so he made it again for him. But Moses had an aspect to do in that. And then he also goes on and say about the iniquity of the people. They, that iniquity will not cause them to be without guilt. <clears throat> God will not, with long-suffering, overlook sin. We need to take care of it. And he's made a provision through Jesus that we can take care of it. And I bless, and that's what brings joy and gladness and peace, long-suffering in, in for us. It's, it's that which is a blessing for us. God gives ample time and opportunity, but judgment will eventually come. That judgment can be extended to other generations. I have to, as I think of that portion of scripture, I think of the statement that the Jewish council made to Pilate when they were asking for Jesus' crucifixion. And Pilate said, what's he done wrong? He can't find anything wrong that he's done. But they were convinced. They did not want him to be left free. He had brought up a person to take his place. And they didn't want it. They wanted Jesus to be crucified. And then they made a statement. They said, his blood be upon us and our children. You find that in Matthew 27, verse 22. Do we do things that bring not only destruction for ourselves, but also future generations that follow us? Do we walk a path of sin that causes them to be hindered from receiving the plan of salvation? Think of the Jews in World War II, the many people, the many Jews that died in a horrible way, terrible way. Were they guilty? No. But could it be that future generations were suffering for what had happened earlier? Their statements and thoughts that were shared earlier. Let's be careful. Let's be long-suffering. Let's be wise in our judgments and what we say and do. In Ezekiel 20, verse 17, 
God concerning the children of Israel said, Nevertheless, mine eye spared them from destroying spared them from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them into the wilderness. Now why did God say that? Didn't all the people that had rebelled against God in the wilderness refuse to go in the promised land because there were giants in there and they were afraid and they can't do it? They all died in the wilderness. But God reserved a remnant. Their children came and were able to enter the promised land, but those others didn't. There were only two that were able to go in, and they were the faithful ones that had trust in the Lord and had long-suffering in mind. And they said, God is able to deliver us, Caleb and Joshua. It doesn't matter that there are giants there. We can overcome them because God is with us. They had a long focus and we're able to trust God in that. God's provision. God's divine forbearance. I'd like to look at a few more verses yet as we continue thinking of long-suffering. Romans 10, 21, it says, But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands into a disobedient and gainsaying people. What I get out of that verse is the thought, it denotes an attitude of entreaty and mercy that God had to the children of Israel. They continued to go away. Then we read in the Old Testament through um, Elijah and, and Zachari- uh, Jeremiah and those prophets, the weeping prophet, lamentations, and they begged God in relation, and they begged the children of Israel to turn back to God. You have strayed. You've gone away. And he pled for them. He didn't pray for judgment, but he said, judgment's coming if you don't. We see a, a uh, attitude of entreaty, drawing power to bring them to their recognition of their sins. And they would not. They wanted to kill those that were doing that or telling them those things. They didn't appreciate it. Then we think of Jonah also, as we think of forbearance for those who needed to repent. Jonah said, or God said, in relation to uh, the destroying of Nineveh, and shall not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than 120,000 people that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. Does that correlate with Jesus saying, for they know not what they do? But God was long-suffering to them, and he was extending them an avenue of repentance that they could turn from their wicked way, and they did. And Jonah was upset about it. He wasn't Sure that he wanted them to be, uh, have that opportunity and be saved. He wasn't long-suffering. He wanted Nineveh to be avenged, to pay for the evil deeds that they had done to children of Israel. But God was long-suffering, and they repented and turned away from their wicked ways. God is not that way. He's long-suffering. He is patient with a purpose, but he's waiting on you and me to continue to walk according to him. If we haven't accepted him yet, he's patiently knocking on our heart's door, drawing us. He wants us to come in and be a part of the fold. God's forbearance and long-suffering to those that are unrepentant and sinful, he continues on. What a forbearance. I'd like to read now in Romans 9, a few verses, four verses to be exact, in relation to God's forbearance and long-suffering and what we can have. Romans 10 and 9, verses 20 to 24. But nay, O man... Nay, but, O man, 
Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay, the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, said, and to make his power known, endureth with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? And he that might make, and he and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath for prepared unto his glory, even to us whom he hath called, not to the Jews only, but also to the Gentiles. He kept himself from those that were vessels of wrath. He could have made known his power, destroyed them, but he didn't. He was long-suffering. And he extended mercy so that we can have that glory, with, that he can receive glory by that experience in our lives and that we live. And it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the Gentiles. It was for all people. We are all called to be his children. Even when we speak reproachfully, he is patient with us because his desire is that all men should be saved not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles, to taste of his love. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants. He wants us to be in his kingdom, to be with him. If we go a little further down in Second Peter 3, 9, it says, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. The long-suffering of God is salvation. Let's reach out and receive it. Let's live it likewise with the spirit of that fruit in our lives, showing forth that we have a desire for all men to be saved likewise. We have a compassion. Man was created to be in communion with God in a relationship with him. Then the last aspect we want to look at is God helps us to be long-suffering. And I'd like to read out of 2 Timothy in relation to his desire for us to be long-suffering. He helps us in that. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3, reading verses 10 through 14. There it says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. This is Paul speaking. Persecutions and afflictions which come to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystria, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving being deceived. Then we have that word. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that thou from a child hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus." All scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God helps us to have that long suffering, to have that experience, to walk according to his will. He helps us to understand it. There's going to be those that will try to get us to stray from it, but he is going to be there and we can have faith and confidence in the scripture that's given by the inspiration of God and it's going to be, a profitable, it's going to be profitable for us. It will be that which teaches us and will help us and correct us and it's an instruction in righteousness for us, getting us ready for eternal glory and to live faithfully here on the earth. 
1 Timothy 1.16 says, Show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe in him to life everlasting. We are to be an example to them. In closing, I'd like to read a verse from the same psalm that we heard earlier this morning in relation to God's long-suffering. Psalm 86, verse 15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Shall we kneel for prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for ministering to us this morning. As we think of that, we think of your great mercy and long-suffering toward us and how it speaks in, into our heart, draws us to you. And we can be challenged as we look at the fruit here that are mentioned in Galatians and to challenge ourselves and to see if we have done according to your will. If we are faithful or if we need improvement, may that instruction help us if we are not. And may it help us to draw near to you and allow your spirit to reach its fullness, to bear hundredfold rather than just a small amount. Help us, Lord, to go all out for you and to live righteously so that we can be the example to others as you would have us to be. That's the way you've chosen to spread your word. And secondly, we can be blessed by it. The love and peace will flow out from us. It's a real liberty, a liberty that will not just be here, but also in eternity, Lord. Thank you for that. And may you help us to grow thereby. We pray this all in thy precious holy name with thanksgiving for the blood that was shed for our sins. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.